Hello there, this is Stuart Davidson here, your friendly bean counter, or otherwise known as your friendly QS. Now, in about 10 minutes, ah, in about 10 minutes, I'm gonna be going live with a webinar over on my page, and I'm gonna be talking about the key things that are facing property developers at the moment, particularly as some of them have closed down, shut shops, etc. And I'm gonna be sharing with you what I found out from, from developers that I've been working with, I think I keep losing the signal. Architects and contractors. Fantastic, so I've spent a little bit of time trying to set all this up. So I've got my Zoom ready, I've got my PowerPoint ready, and I've got my Loom ready to record it. I've, I've sorted it all out, I've set it up this morning, all ready to go, and unlike the uh, these kind of really slick professionals are doing it all the time, me, in my world, I'm messing about with passwords, I'm messing about setting things up, going to click the buttons and that's not working, so <laughs> this is a complete rookie stuff. I'm a QS or a bean counter, so getting into the realms of entertainment and contact uh, and, and content creation is something really new. So anyway, so I've set that up and what I'm finding now is that um, I bet the signal's gonna be tripping out. I'm on a balcony out here, soaking up the sun. I'm in a little bit of a shaded spot. So you might hear uh, a bit of noise from the road and the neighbors and everything going on. It's gonna be completely kind of, um, uh, completely real really, down to earth. So if you're interested in a slightly deeper dive and get my reflection on where we are, where, where the developers are uh, at the moment and key things that you can look out for, opportunities and risks, um, then pop over to my page, Stuart Davidson page, my Stuart Davidson QS Consult page in about five minutes and I'll be doing a live, my first live webinar. So I'm not sure how it's gonna go, but I've got my slides ready. I've got everything ready to record and we'll see how it goes. This is Stuart Davidson, your friendly QS, signing off and I'll see you over on my page. It's QS Consult in about five minutes. And today I wanted to go through some of the things I've been learning over the last week or two from developers and architects and contractors um, as I phoned calls, made calls and phoned around uh, last week and some of the things that I wanted to share with you around where people are, um, you know, what the risks are, what the opportunities are at the moment and kind of what's, what's going on out there because I know some of you will be um, starting the sites up again um, what I found is I phoned around actually that the larger developers that have got large staff are probably still closed or hard to get hold of, where the smaller ones have either kept going um, using social distancing etc or they've got plans for the future and also I found that the um, developers that are high, highly leveraged with finance are more sceptical than those that are using cash. Now I can see why, because if you're, if you're highly leveraged, for example, if you've bought uh, property on a, on a bridging loan or, or bridging finance, and you're faced with delays on your project, which A, the lockdown is a delay, and also when you get back, one of the key issues is around the supply of materials and your supply chain, etc. You're gonna be more uh, concerned around the length of time that that finance contract the length of time you've got left on your finance contract and of course if you go over that you're going to incur, incur extra costs where those are using their own cash um, yes it is an issue you want to return on investment but you haven't got those other added pressures um, so i'm going to just run through some of the key issues if this thing will work so we go on to my next slide yep so here we are so the key thing is, I think there's a little bit of a lag on this. So I did say it was a bit of an experiment. Uh, let me just check to see if that's gonna change over. Go back. Um, yep, material, yeah. So the key things, if, you're, if you've got a development, material prices, lead times, and productivity are gonna be your key concerns at the moment. And what I'm hearing now that's moved on an extra slide. So just bear with me a second and I shall just take it back. 
this is all a bit of an experiment because I haven't done one of these lives and doing a um, uh, a kind of a presentation at the same time but there's only one way to learn things isn't there and that's to actually do it so this is a complete um, first time so right so the thing I wanted to talk about uh, and around people's concerns and what I'm hearing about from the grapevine and on the ground is one of the biggest concerns at the moment is material prices well three material prices lead times and productivity so material prices what I'm hearing is that because particularly on manufactured goods batteries have closed down so it's going to take them time to get up and running again some haven't um, it's going to take the merchants time to get stocked again and some haven't even opened yet and I'm, I'm hearing that even some materials are, uh, you know, if, if people can get hold of them, they're three times, four times the price. So one thing you need to think about if you've got a project that is starting up again is around your material supply. Now, the some developers have stocked up with materials and they're not overly too concerned. But those, those of you that may have not stocked up with your materials and you're still looking to order and you're looking at your program, um, what you need to do is to really get in touch with merchants, suppliers, manufacturers right now to see what the availability of materials are and what the prices are going to be. Because if you've started a project and you've got a set budget, then this could seriously affect your budget, the material prices and the material availability. That means that lead times on your items are going to be higher, longer. How's that going to affect your funding? How's that going to affect if you're on bridging and refinancing? What's the end date for your bridging finance? You know, does it now, does it still, obviously it would have been pushed out and hopefully you'd have been talking to your funders just to see if you can renegotiate that. But you know, don't underestimate the seriousness and the issue with material supply. And I would say get more involved. Don't just leave it to your contractor because he's going to be struggling as well around getting materials. So what you don't want is you don't want the contractor to come back on site full blown prelims and then he's turning around, well, we can't continue because of materials. Now, contractually, that might be down to him, but you don't want to be in a contractual dispute because he's going to come back with certain arguments whereby the current situation um, is a false majeure or it's this or it's that. Um, that's a completely different um, ball game. And believe me, there will be a lot of um, argy-bargy going on, particularly because everyone's strapped for cash. Cash flow is pretty much ground to a halt and everyone will be defending their position. So what started out as, you know, we're all trying to work together, um, you know, it, in my experience, it comes back to your commercial interests and you know business is a commercial interest you know they're, they're a different identity to the people so you know you have to um, you have to kind of plan ahead I would sit down if you've already got a contractor and work out the best way through it it's always best to do that as um, soon as you start to um, take up your kind of polarized positions on a contract you know it's going to start costing you more money so that's the best thing but I would say check your material prices because the word on the ground is that a they're hard to come materials are harder to come by and they're going to cost you more and the lead time is going to be longer that's going to affect your cash flow on your funding and your return on investment and the time it takes to if you've got an investment that you're looking to uh, to flip at some time in the future or you're looking to rent certain properties out then that's going to affect all of that whole cycle. So material prices, lead time. And the other thing is productivity. Of course, with the CLC um, guidance, the government guidance on social distancing with, uh, with regard to um, working on site, that's going to slow your productivity down. So I would uh, have a look at that, see how things are going uh, as you start to open your site up again and then you do it in phases but um, see what your uh, how that's affecting productivity a good way to do it is what's called a measured mile 
So measure uh, a period of time of productivity before the shutdown, if you've been monitoring your program, and then start to measure the productivity uh, for a week, two weeks, a month, and then compare the type of productivity that you're getting. And then that will feed back into your program. Combine that with uh, your material leads ti lead times and work out how that's going to your, affect your program, but m above all, how that is going to affect your cash flow in terms of your, your, your funding, your development funding, pain of your supply chain, so it's all going to change, and I think you really need to look at it and and re uh, review it, revamp it, readjust, and then really come up with a new approach, a new strategy to finishing your project. If you haven't started a project yet and you're looking to start projects, um, these are the things you need to take into account. Is it worth starting a project now or leaving it a couple of months for material prices to settle down, for merchants to get restocked? for people to get used to the different type of working and looking at how they can improve productivity and while maintaining social distancing. So these are the three main things that have been raised with me last week from people that I've spoken to, from developers, architects and contractors, material prices, lead times and productivity. Three things that you really need to look at now if you have a project that you've got on the go or you're looking to start a new project don't underestimate this because it could seriously affect uh, how your the success of your project. So, the next slide I wanted to look at is funding cash flow in the market. And of course, funding, funders are gonna be nervous. If you've got finance, they're gonna be very nervous. They may reassess their exposure to risk. So you need to be reassuring them a, if you've got a project that you've, you're, you're looking to start, or B, if you've started a project, you've had lockdown, you've closed the doors for a little while, you know, get in touch with your funders because they may have reassessed their exposure to risk. That may affect your monthly drawdown for your cash. It's very important. You don't want to get everybody back on site and everything up and running and then talk to your, your, your funder or your financer and they're saying, well, look, you know, to be honest, uh, you know, this was the plan, you know, this is what your drawdown was going to be beforehand, but, you know, we're, we're a bit concerned, we need to, um, we're wanting to look at this again, so make sure that you've got that cash flow forecast revamped, you're speaking to your funder, and, uh, you know, you, you're, you're trying to work, work your way through it. Don't, don't kind of ignore it, because you don't want to be in a position where, your supply chain or your contract is waiting for funding and it's not there when you expected it to be. So, so I talk, to, talk to your funder on that one. Now in terms of cash flow through your supply chain, this is a really important one because your contractor and your supply chain, there will be demands on their cash. So if you had already paid your, your contractor uh, before the lockdown and he hasn't had the opportunity to pay the, the supply chain, uh, that's a high risk, you know. Is he still in a, is, has there been other demands on that cash? Is that cash still available now to pay the supply chain? Um, or have, you know, just check that the, your suppliers have been paid. Um, so check that your, your contractor and your suppliers are still um, solvent, to be honest. So they're still able to carry out the project. What about their, their suppliers and their supply chain? You know, I, I would do a, a brand new due diligence because things have changed a lot. There's, you know, there's people out there and it's a sad fact that there will be businesses struggling. You know, there will be businesses that um, are being chased by the, their uh, creditors, you know. So re reassess where your contractor and your supply chains are. Now there is a way around this and there might be a way around it, uh, but you do need to get more involved. Um, on some contracts you can have if you've got warranties and you've got step-in rights, you can sometimes uh, take more of a, a control over the, the, the cash flow and the supply chain, etc. You can contact them directly, or if you're on a construction management route, then obviously you've got contracts with the suppliers and hopefully you've been keeping in touch with those and they're already financially um, sound to continue with your project. If you're a traditional route where you're paying your contractor and relying on your contractor to cash flow the project, 
I would be um, I would look into it some contractors are not um, not very open to uh, revealing uh, details about their, their supply chain but at the end of the day you're the client you're paying the money yes you have got a contract but these are uh, special times but you know if it's my money and I'm the developer and I've got a contractor I need to make sure that that supply chain is still sound it's solvent it's ready to go that there's no adverse financial conditions no CCJs no no court cases coming up um, you know that we're already good to go my cash is ready and my cash is in my project the other way to do it if you haven't started yet you can start afresh with your cash flow and I would do this if you're if you haven't started a project yet and you're looking to start a project, you know, there's a couple of things at play here. A is there's gonna be higher cash flow pressures than there normally is throughout your supply chain. Also, um, there's a prediction that um, property prices, land prices might reduce. We won't see the full extent of that for a couple of weeks. Um, we've got estate agents, so you get estate agents, valuations, etc. Uh, at the moment and they'll start where they carried that where they left off about eight weeks ago but where the real values are going to come in is when your develop when your uh, development financier or your mortgage broker sends his valuer out that's when we'll see when what what the real uh, damage damage is um, but um, yeah so um, the other thing that will happen and because of that because of uh, people are expecting a, a, a redu reduction in in property prices then you know there will be some contractors that are thinking this this time is ripe for um, cash farming what I mean by cash farming is contractors will look to use their resources to buy um, and essentially what they're doing is they're pooling payments that they get from their client they're gonna they're, they're paying uh, they, they, they're looking out for cash deals so a cash property that they can purchase refinance quickly get the get the uh, money back to support their um, their cash flow and then that, that money will come back in to pay the supply chain on your project. Now that takes time and in the past I'm not saying that you know I'm not casting judgment on this practice but if someone was doing that if a contractor was doing that with my money and hadn't paid my con my supply chain I wouldn't be best pleased about it but I can tell you it's a common common practice and the market is just about to get to a place where it's ripe for it so watch out for that if you're a developer and I would link up the way that you can do this I would use a procurement route where you keep control of the supply chain a procurement route where you can at least keep control of the cash in the supply chain you could use a procurement route where you gave the contractor not all contractors would be up for this but some forward-looking contractors will be um, that they can get a fee for bringing the supply chain and vetting the supply chain and but you still control the supply chain in terms of the money the discounts etc um, etc et um, the contractor could have it you could ring fence the contractors overheads and profit you could ring fence his fee for bringing supply chain but really in these times you want to be in control of the cash throughout your supply chain uh, and you can link up your funder with your supply chain and it's something we we're doing with our our clients we're managing that supply that cash that cash flow making sure that money stays in the project that's not leaking out through cash farming that it's not leaking out through other uh, means other demands on cash from the contractor or each of the separate suppliers you know you might have specialist subcontractors that um, are robbing Peter to pay Paul you know they're waiting for money to come in on another project before they can buy materials for your project you know it goes on and you need to get you know if you're a developer this is the type of market that you need to be really really vigilant so um, just bear that in mind now market again I've just I've kind of touched upon the market I think there will be a nervousness on uh, for lenders on on um, lending on development so you need to be you need to be preparing a really really good sound case to your development development finances uh, you need to if it's say for example you're looking at a development and it might be a, you've seen a piece of land that you think could be a good deal and you're looking at it and you're going to your finance so they're going to be nervous about it at the moment 
you know planning departments are slow at the moment um, you know the cash flow uh, is slow contractors will need um, you know we need to verify that the contractor is okay to to do the work etc and uh, your monitoring surveyor will have his report will be robust and he'll be wanting to know uh, your cash flow what how you're going to get from purchasing the property to day one drawdown through and then uh, how how that finance is, is drawn down throughout the construction project when you're going to get a return on your investment when mo when is money going to start coming in for you and this gets back to the market so what's the market going to be like for uh, flips for sales for rental now I, I think that people are going to have if it's a residential for example market I think people are going to struggle to get mortgages uh, for a while um, I think there's going to be a nervousness there's going to be lenders are going to raise the bar for that and I think uh, people are going to be looking to rent so one of the opportunities could be rental market build to rent or more importantly um, could be rent to rent to buy schemes that, that kind of thing but what you need to work out now uh, what with longer lead times for materials uh, maybe higher cost for materials that might affect how you the speed at which you go forward um, slower planning process uh, until I think there'll be a backlog of everything planning process um, making sure that you've done uh, you probably need to do more surveys on your your projects for example I had one to look at the other day and um, someone sent me this piece of land it was quite a large piece of land um, that they thought was a really good deal and uh, I looked at it and uh, did some due diligence on, on that in terms of the planning now it's not in Greenbelt not in the area of natural beauty um, it looks possible it's been used as grazing land at the moment um, there's some issues with access um, and I thought you know it does seem quite high the price that the owner wanted for it for grazing land I would have said it was a is about I would have said personally it was about five grand an acre too high uh, really um, but what you need to do I looked at so I went to the planning conditions um, uh, sorry I went to the land registry and had a look at the uh, the registry document and what I discovered in there was that the the land was over mines um, old mine shafts although they were 400 foot down you know these things can be overlooked um, initially you know so you kind of got to do due diligence around the actual site itself and also the site was quite sloping so I mean last time I did a a, a, a project where we built over la uh, over mines mine shafts before um, what you need to do what is expensive about that the surveys uh, for those are very 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 expensive don't underestimate that and then what they're looking for is fissures fissures between the mine and the surface where you want to put your foundations in it can make a big difference and um, you end up pumping loads and loads of grout in there you don't know how much grout you're going to need till it's full up and I remember on that project it was the uh, the grout in the, the survey and the grout in uh, albeit it was a, a heavier building than a residential but that was about a quarter of a million pound just to do that so do your due diligence on your if you see a piece of land or property you know look into the technical aspects what surveys are there what's in the ground I mean it might be contamination I mean getting getting rid of contaminated uh, soil don't underestimate that and then on the um, on the site this one's a sloping site so there's going to be retaining walls etc etc that need to be fed into the um, cost now why am I saying all of this is because if you're looking to finance a project your monitoring surveyor will ask you for all this information so it's always best to do a detailed um, survey making sure before you uh, you provide a, uh, before you even look at um, you get that far you make sure that you're looking down all these different uh, aspects of uh, it's not only the site it's ownership are there any leases on the site are there any um, covenants on the site you know which most of you do anyway but I think you just need to be a little bit more vigilant so the market my view is that uh, property prices will come down a little bit there'll be a lot more motivated sellers um, you know there'll be sellers that because that, that, the last couple of years um, I think 
property, I think uh, land in particular has been inflated. I think there'll be um, developers that have bought land at inflated prices that might struggle if, if they've closed down. Um, you know, what with tight margins, with the close down, with increased material prices, lead times, uh, product and reduced productivity, I think that could push them over the edge. So, you know, they, I, th I think there will be a, there will be a reduction. There will be opportunities uh, for purchasing, as long as you put these things in place. Your due diligence, you're checking out um, how material prices, lead times, productivity is going to affect your project and your construction costs. Because developers, God bless them, they notoriously undervalue the cost of construction quite often. Sorry about that, but that's what I find in my experience. And so when um, you, so on your projects, if you've got a project, you've had the doors closed for a little while, you want to start up again. Um, now my view is to have a side agreement, and I, I did a video a little, t a little while ago uh, around how we can get over the contractual issues. Um, and I talked about a side agreement, but start speaking to your contractor in your supply chain straight away. I did this, uh, I did that video probably, what, uh, I don't know, six weeks ago, something like that. And if you've done that, good, and you've got some agreements, side agreements. But as pressure builds up commercially, um, as contractors in the supply chain struggle to get materials, particularly manufactured goods, as they come back and productivity is not so quick, not so fast, and yet they're still finding they have to pay their workforce um, similar amount. You're gonna, everyone's gonna be under pressure, so they're gonna want to defend their contractual position. And we heard a lot. There's been a lot of um, blogs and posts from lawyers and solicitors around uh, the adequacy of contract terms of standard contracts. And of course, it depends on your own contract. But I think there's going to be a peak, a spike in contractual claims because there's so much uncertainty. Uh, th there's there's kind of grey areas within the within a lot of contracts. And uh, that's all got to be thrashed out. So if you're starting up again or you're starting a project, be well, if you're starting up again, be ready for uh, this. How can I put this? Uh, not necessarily, uh, you might not necessarily have a crystallized dispute, but there will be discussions, and probably disagreements over the, what a contract means. But your best way is to try and find an equitable agreement between the parties to move forward. Because let's face it, you know, everyone's going to have to take something on the chin. You know, you, you, you it might be that you've got to get advice from your lawyers, your solicitors. Uh, but what will happen is your your um, your costs will, will escalate. So you want to avoid, um, I'm not saying avoid getting legal advice because you should do that. But if you can come to uh, an amicable solution, which is an equitable solution on some of these gray areas like force majeure, um, around determination, around you know uh, productivity, uh, and and then the new one is um, around the availability of materials. You know, um, the government haven't really helped because they've said the site should carry on going all the way through, which which kind of cancels out force majeure on a lot of contracts. So, I think just be be ready. I would start getting somebody to go through your contract terms, through through the making sure you've got your records ready, and even if you're not going to go uh, legal on anything like that, um, get your house in order. Makes it easier to sit down with your supply chain and your contractors, and just to um, you know, so that you're ready, you're prepared, that you're even ready. You can't really get in a position where you can make an agreement or negotiate an agreement if you haven't got all your stuff. Um, coordinated and ordered, your records ordered, checking that against your contract terms so you can see where your exposure is, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, where your strengths and weaknesses of contract are. And then you can come to that, that line in the middle where your agreement's going to sit, you know? But get your red line sorted out. It means getting yourself organised in terms of claims. But I, I think there will be a spike in claims. I think that's unavoidable, so be ready for that. Now, if you're about to start your project um, or a new project, think about procurement. Now, traditional procurement is is notorious, have 
notoriously adversarial. I think there's people really don't quite know what to do at the moment and how that applies to the current situation. Uh, but I would really look at, I think procurement's going to change. And the real place I think it's going to change is uh, who's, con who's in control of the supply chain. Now, previously, it's been, um, I mean, the two key, key ways of looking at it is either you go a traditional route with a con you employ a contractor, then he, he employs the supply chain. So he owns the supply chain, he's in control of the supply chain. Personally, as a PQS, I don't like that. I've never liked it. Um, because a PQS is employed at the beginning of a project, right at the beginning when you're doing an investment appraisal. You know, you've seen a piece of land and then we'll help you with the budgets for that. Is there profitability? Does the, does the, does the project stack up? Are, are we realistic about the potential um, construction costs? And we'll uh, be involved in appointing a contractor. Now traditionally, um, you know, the traditional method was um, you employ a contractor, he would provide the supply chain. But you know, my old view was, you know, having spent some time preparing the budgets with the client, the developer, looking after the the the, um, uh, the, the cost the cost plan side, is that as soon as a contractor is appointed, you kind of lose control of that budget. The client lose control of the budget, and then it's the responsibility for the contractor. I don't like it as a PQS because when things start to um, go wrong or things take longer or there's delay, disruption, um, I'm not in control anymore. The contractor's in control. Um, I don't always get to see what's going on under the bonnet. You know, you can have open book and all the rest of it and that's fine and, and we do that and I would recommend that quite often. But if it's a design and build, you don't always see what's going on underneath the hood once it gets to contractor side. I'm, a, I'm, a, I, I'm really in favour of keeping control. My most successful projects as a PQS is where I've been in control of the procurement and the money, the cash flow right the way through. That way I can make sure that the client is, uh, I'm making sure that the client's budget uh, is being maintained. If you pass that responsibility on to a contractor, which traditional contracts do, you're relying on somebody else's um, expertise in managing cash flow and some contractors are good some contractors are absolutely hopeless and some and it's not just the contractor it's the the sub subcontractor and the suppliers you know we're putting our um, our you know the client ends up putting his faith into the um, expertise and ability of the suppliers different hands in the supply chain to manage cash flow expertly. Now these guys, contractors and suppliers and builders, are experts at solving complex problems coming to build contracts, uh, coming to build buildings. They are great at building buildings, they are great at planning buildings, coordinating the works, etc, etc, etc. So why on earth do we place the, cons the cash flow in their hands when we are responsible for the cash flow? It's our money, it's our borrowing, it's our lending, you know, we want to be able to see that clearly as it flows through the um, supply chain. So I'm a lot more in favour of keeping this uh, control of, at least control of the cash. You know, even if you're keeping, you're, you're allowing the contractor to uh, keep control of the supply chain in terms of the health and safety, um, the ability of the supplier to deliver, etc., etc., etc. You know, they like to control the old. The old school contractors like to control the money, but you know, I've I've seen it so often where a, a developer client has paid a contractor. Contractor's gone bust. They've lost the money. One recently lost two hundred and fifty thousand pound. Paid the contractor. Contractor went bust. And then we know all about Carillion and the fallout of them and numerous other. And there's a record number of contractors going bust at the moment. You know, and they were going bust from January um, in record numbers, and that's without the lockdown. So, guys, if you're a developer, you know, g get a grip on the cash flow, get a grip on who's going to control the cash flow, make sure you're doing your due, due diligence. You don't want to be paying uh, out for money that's not vested in your project. So, basically, every penny that you pay out on your project needs to be 
paying, uh, building an asset. It needs to be buying an asset. It doesn't want to be sitting in someone's bank account or someone's op uh, uh, business operational bank account. It needs to be sitting in your project um, and you need to be gaining an asset with that money. And the way to do that is to have a third party, someone like, I mean, the business that we do is uh, we provide that uh, service to make sure that cash is managed by an independent third party, that everyone is getting paid when they should get paid and the money is going to where it goes. And you're not gonna be stuck in that situation where you've paid a contractor and, and then they go bust. And you know, it's unfortunate you know, it's a sad situation, but it's inevitable that as we come out of lockdown, we haven't seen the full extent of it yet. But where, where I'm seeing slowdown in productivity, I'm seeing uh, increasing material prices, I'm seeing uh, lengthened lead times, and that's going to put pressure on you as a developer because when are you going to get your drawdown? Is your drawdown going to cover your costs? Where it might have done before, but it might not do now, that means you might be late paying your contractor and then that puts him under pressure. But he might have six or seven projects, he's got the same problem. And the moment his cash flow stops is, manage, is the moment it stops and you're vulnerable. So I would look at, when we look at procurement, uh, I would look at uh, you know, a new way of procurement where you can employ the expertise of a contractor, maybe purchase his supply chain to a certain degree. So now put it this way, Contractors spend a lot of years um, honing their supply chains. They've got a really good supply chain. That's what makes them successful. So they're not going to give their supply chain over um, uh, for nothing for free. You know, they'll want to, you know, but you can, you know, there's always different ways to do this. I mean, you know, you can ring fence a fee to say, look, bring, the con bring your supply chain, we'll pay you a fee to use your supply chain on our project but we want to benefit from the discounts in that supply chain. We want to benefit from uh, managing the cash flow. And the advantage you get, Mr. Contractor, is that you haven't got to worry about robbing Peter to pay Paul, because our cash is gonna be released on the basis of actual work within the project, uh, paid for uh, on an ongoing basis. And also, um, it frees, what it does, it, it frees the contractor up from, uh, you know, you can still buy their expertise without, them, without having to worry about that. Um, you can hear that is a, there's a lorry loading up out there, so that's what that noise is out there. Um, so actually, oh, it's a dustbin then. Yeah, so you can, um, you can help the contractor, and also you can bring, um, uh, you can reduce the risk for the lender as well, because they're going to be really concerned about where their cash is going. So if you have a transparent, open cash flow management system, is something that we run. Um, you know, it's going to reduce their risk. It's going to give you an opportunity, uh, uh, more opportunity funding. But the uh, the other thing I was going to say about the contractor uh, was that. You know, if they use this type of system, you you know they've got more opportunity. They've got opportunity for more projects, because certainly from where I sit and we're talking to um, funders um, and and developers, uh, is that they'd be more likely to give uh, a contractor a, a project if they were happy to look at this new procurement approach, whereby um, you know we can pay them for their expertise, we can pay them for bringing their supply chain, but we want the benefit of the costs, we want the benefit of the discounts, and we want to see transparent cash flow. So we want to reduce risks on our side, and we want to reduce the risks on the supply chain side. With what I've just talked about, which is the robbing Peter to pay Paul, somebody goes bust, and then the developer has to pay twice, etc., etc. And there'll be a lot of, and also the risk of uh, cash farming gone wrong. Now, I'm not judging cash farming. I, I don't agree with it, to be fair. I know it goes on. I know it goes on widely, um, and it depends on what the market is. If the market's right for it, it happens more. I think we're entering into a market that's gonna happen more. So if you're a developer, make sure you're protecting yourself, making sure you're keeping the cash in your project, making sure you're um, 
talking to somebody who can manage that cash and knows how to procure the project to reduce the risks uh, involved in the new, well it's a new world we're ent entering into. The old world is gone, the new world is coming. The old world of traditional contracting is changing. Contractors will know that, financiers will know that, and we just need to have a bit of blue sky thinking, lead the way. It's about time uh, this slow movement of cash culture within the construction in industry changes. I think this is going to be a catalyst for it. I'd love to drive it forward. I think that construction punches way below its weight in wealth creation. Money loves speed, and it doesn't get that with construction. Everyone tries to hang on to their cash, which is counterintuitive. So what I would uh, recommend is we look at a new way of working, a new way of procurement, for keeping control of the cash on the developer's side, and keeping control of the expertise on the contractor's side. So contracts. Now contracts are ancient, you know, whether you're talking about the NEC or the new NEC or the JCT or the new JCT, they're all pretty much uh, based on, they're built and designed by lawyers and all due respect to lawyers and we need them, you know, and it, you know we do need them to be honest and we'll always need them. But you see the thing is, what you've got to realise is that disputes in construction in the UK is a five billion pound industry. I'll say that again. Disputes in construction is a five billion pound industry. If we had perfect contracts and contracts that work, that wouldn't be a five billion pound industry, would it? And that five billion pound would be going back into investing in property. Yeah? So it's time for change. You know, we get tall and they teach in the universities. What they teach kids in the universities is standard forms of contract, JCT, NEC, this, that, and the other, you know, um, FIDIC, um, you know, and all these different things. And they teach and teach and teach you that. And it's ingrained in the culture. And don't get me wrong, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, you've got to have a contract. And I think they're all, um, you know, they've served the purpose, but things, things definitely have to change. The industry has to change, the culture has to change, and I think there are drivers. There's drivers in terms of cash flow management and blockchain. There's drivers in terms of modular construction. Um, not necessarily volumetric, but um, there can be uh, modular within modules, modules within modules. I think that social distance is gonna change the way we construct buildings. Social, social distancing will change. So contracts, uh, they need, they're all going to become simpler. Uh, I would say that there'll be a, uh, you know, the, the, the way I look at it and what will work in the interim, I think contracts are going to change over the next couple of years. Um, you know, the starting point is a kind of more alliance-based contract. Now, you, you know, the NEC have got new alliance contract out and there's a number of other alliance contracts out there. I think they're, they're more flexible. I think they lend themselves to um, different ownerships of supply chains, different um, uh, transparency of supply chains. I think it divvies up the risk. There's more flexibility on how you divvy up the risk. Um, you know, and after, at the end of the day, with a standard form of contract, there's only four or five clauses that are uh, used anyway. You get a 100-page document, and, uh, and, and, and the only thing, there's only a couple of clauses which could put on a side of an A4 that's ever used. You know, variations, delay, disruption. They're the main ones. Obviously, there's insurance clauses that you need, which goes without saying. But um, pretty much, pretty much that's it, you know. Unforeseen circumstances, delay, disruption, and... Um, whatever causes delay and disruption is one of the biggest ones going. Um, you know, so, but things are gonna change and I think we will get to smart contracts, to be honest, and we'll have a better distribution of um, who's responsible for what and a better distribution of um, placing the risk in the hands of the people most able to carry the risk. What we've had in the past is cascade down. So the risk is passed from, now clients and developers, quite often get advised to go a certain route. 
con contractor route, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying they're not appropriate at certain times, but one route that's become so popular, which is design and build, and it, in my mind, it's not always uh, well advised because it puts, it cascades down the, uh, the risk and ultimately, the people that carry the risks are the supply chain and the client. Contractors are very good at standing in the middle with a clipboard, basically, on a design and build. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it works and it's appropriate in certain circumstances, but it's overused. And one of the reasons top consultancies um, uh, advise design and build is because they, it's not so much, it's not as high risk on them as a consultancy. They don't have to do bills of quantities. They're not responsible for getting a, a, a quantities wrong in a bill and, and that kind of thing. So I can see why it's become a popular thing to advise on, but it's not always the best way. And I think that you need to look at the contract in terms of the actual project at hand and how much, uh, and uh, understand the risks and the commercial interests of each of the parties involved and how much they can carry. You know, because you don't want to destroy your supply chain by passing the risk down the line. You know, you want to make sure that you've accounted for the risk properly. So that's contracts, and that could be a bespoke contract, could be a, a, an alliance contract, could be a standard form of contract, but I think, you know, don't just accept uh, a standard form of contract because it's a standard form of contract. You know, just make sure that you're looking at your project at hand and what you've got is going to work for you right the way through. So, last slide. Cut property coming out. So, what do we think? I've covered most of it, probably not in the right order. So, we've got rental, rental buying options for developers. Now, I think that uh, flips will be difficult. I think that it would be difficult to move property on. Um, I'm not sure what you think, but uh, I think under the circumstances, it, people are going to be nervous about purchasing uh, or not being able to get mortgages. You'll get lots of cash buyers. I think there's going to be lots of opportunities for cash buyers. Um, you know, if you've got a project at the moment, you know, you've got to think about, am I going to be able to sell these properties? But I think there'll be, a, personally, I think you might need to flip them around into rentals. Um, I think rental market is going to increase in a number of ways, um, not least because there'll be less money, lending money a, a, a around, or they'll raise the bar on lending. And uh, there'll be, people will be under distress, you know, people will be downsizing, um, you know, there'll be distressed landlords, there'll be all sorts of um, motivated uh, people in terms of um, wanting to move on but not being able to either maintain the profitability of their own current portfolio or um, you know they can't find a property. So I think there'll be lots of opportunities for rental accommodation if you're building to rent or you're providing an opportunity for a rent to buy at some time in the future. Um, if you're looking at rent to rents, there'll be an opportunity there with an with a option uh, with a landlord or, or an owner. A lot of opportunities there um, and options option agreements might be something to look at option agreements can take many many different forms you can use option agreements for land purchasing I'm looking at one at the moment where the land is tricky and well because I think that the, the time you, you don't want to so the thing is buying land you know you don't necessarily want to buy land and sit on money uh, that have the money tied up in that land um, to get planning, particularly at the moment where things are uncertain, how long the planning process is going to take. So an option to option a call, uh, option subject to planning might be a good one for that. Um, or if you want to use a, a, a property, a piece of land uh, for a different use and you think you can make that asset um, more profitable than it is at the moment, so there could be option agreements that you could do with an owner. So you might not necessarily have to own the land or own the property you know, but you feel that you can put that asset to good use. You know, uh, you could change abuse or you could intensify the use of that um, that property and make a profit on it, uh, cover the uh, uh, owner's, landlord's costs. 
and uh, have an option to maybe purchase that at a later date or do a purchase with an overage. There's all sorts of different things you can do with options. And if there's not money about and it's harder to, um, harder to um, get finance, you know, option agreements might be something and uh, that you can do. But speak to the owners, uh, developers, vendors, you know, and I think these will be something that uh, uh, will become used more and more actually coming out of the lockdown because of uncertainty. And, uh, and I think with an option agreement, it kind of deals with uncertainty because it gives you time. It gives you more time to uh, research. It gives you more time to see what the market's doing. And as long as it stacks up and you really want to, if you're doing any agreement, negotiation, option, um, you want to um, get a win-win situation for everyone involved. That's the best way to do it. Um, you know, and in fact, something that I had thought of uh, a while back in terms of contracts is that, you know, if you've got a difficult situation in a contract, you know, you've closed the doors and circumstances have changed, You've got different, uh, the material prices have changed, lead times have changed, productivity's changed. Uh, you're not sure what your current contract means for this current situation. You might be able to agree an option, you know? There may be equitable options for both parties that you can get a win-win situation in. Um, you know, it might be a side agreement option until you can, to buy, buy both parties time. You know, it might be an option to take over the cash flow management of the supply chain. If you're on a traditional contract with a main contractor, you might have an option agreement to take over certain aspects of the cash, um, you know, uh, to help the contractor, to help uh, satisfy your lender that you're doing the right thing, that you're taking control, that you can see the money in the particular project, you know? And uh, yeah, so that's my views. There's a lot of things that I've covered there. Uh, of course, if there's anything that I've discussed that you want to talk to me about, you know, feel free to private message me, give me a ring. I'm happy to give you, you know, a call. And um, I'll be interested to hear your views, what your uh, problems, uh, what your challenges are at the moment, and particularly over the next couple of weeks. And here's what I'm doing for people at the moment is that if you've got a problem on a project that you're not sure which way direction to go in, what the solutions could be, um, give me a ring. I'm, I'm giving three 15 mi minute consultations. But in addition to that, what I'm gonna do is, if you, if, is to draft up a written, uh, kind of a written proposal, if you like, of a number of options that you could look at. Now, whether you use those uh, those solutions um, uh, to, to, to come back and, and, and to work with me or not, you know, we, we, it depends on whether we, um, it depends on you really, you know, whether that solution is, is, um, is suitable for you. But I'm quite happy to do a 15 minute call and provide you with a written solution or a number of options that you can use to, um, just by way of adding value to you, giving you some ideas, giving you the benefit of my experience. Um, yeah, so my experience, I've been in the game uh, around construction, manufacturing for 40 years. I had my first business, which was a steel work business in the 80s, um, studied at university in the 90s, became a charter surveyor at the beginning of the noughties, and uh, I've worked for some of the major consultancy companies in London that are some of them are the largest in the world. And I've run QS Consult for 10 years and I've helped clients and developers on projects from 250,000 up to 150 million. Uh, so I've been around the block a lot. I've used a lot of contracts, uh, seen a lot of disputes. Um, you know, so I've got a lot of good ideas, you know, so yep, happy if you want me to if you want to call with me, 15 minute call, and um, I'm happy to give you a, a quick report, maybe a one or two page A4 with certain solutions that you might use in your project if you've got a problem or a pain or something that you can't you're not you're not kind of seeing the, the wood for the trees on. Very happy to do that. So this is Stuart Davidson, your friendly bean counter, otherwise known as your friendly PQS. 
hope you've enjoyed this, I don't know what you call it, a webinar, a presentation, a live feed. Mm, there's three repurposes. Uh, it's my first one actually on live, so hope you've enjoyed it. This is Stuart Davidson signing off. Thank you very much. <laughs>